Unit 6, Further Application of the Truth Table Method. In the previous unit, we learned how to use truth tables in order to determine the validity of an argument that we're given. We use both the long truth table method, we laid out all the possible combinations, substitution instances, and then determined whether or not there was a row in the joint truth table in which we had all true premises and a false conclusion to determine whether or not an argument is valid. And we also did the short truth table method, which was just the abbreviated version where we attempted to see whether or not we could construct an invalid instance um, in which there were all true premises and a false conclusion. So in either, in either instance, what we were doing was determining the validity of the argument presented to us. Truth tables can also be used for other things aside from determining validity. So we can identify certain properties that statements have, and this is where we'll be talking about tautologies, contradictions, and contingencies. And we can also discuss relationships between statements in logical implication and consistency and some other um, properties that sets of statements have. So what we're doing here is really nothing new from the previous um, unit. As long as you understand how to construct a truth table, then what you need in order to master what we're doing in unit six is simply to understand what the truth table is telling you. So if we're looking at a single statement, certain statements have, have properties that are defined by whether the results under the main connective are all true or false or both true and false. So really it's understanding what the definition is. What is the truth table actually telling you? So it's extremely important unit six that you memorize the various definitions that are given because you already have the skills to do the problems. There's nothing new in terms of techniques or how to use truth tables. It's the same setup that you've done in the previous unit. What you need to do now is be able to recognize what the truth table is telling you once you finish constructing it. One of the things that we can do with truth tables is identify the properties of statement forms. There are three types of properties that, that a statement can have in sentential logic. Certain properties are what we call tautologies, and tautologies are simply statements that if you were to do a truth table for them, they would always come up true under the main connective. And all that means is that no matter what you substitute in for the variables in the expression is that once you substitute those, you'll always come up true. So the most obvious example, this first one, P or not P. And you see here that this statement is always going to be true regardless of what I substitute in for P. So if P is true, then I get true or and not P is false. Well, I get true right? This statement is going to be true. If I substitute P for as false, then I get P is false, right? And, or I should say P or not P. So not false is true, which again is going to give me true. So it doesn't matter what I substitute in. It's always going to be true. And since it's always true, we call that a tautology. The second property a statement can have is a contradiction. So statements which are always false, regardless of the truth value assigned to the variable. So no matter what I substitute in for P in the second example, so you have P and not P is a sort of classic example of a contradiction. If P is true, then not P is false, making this false. If P ends up being false, so if I substitute in false for P, I get false and not false is true, but that still gives me false. So no matter what I substitute in for P, whether it's true or whether it's false, it always comes up false. Now these are very simple examples. But other statements have these same properties, even, even ones that are far more complex. The final thing is what happens when a statement is sometimes true and sometimes false? That's simply what a contingency is. So a contingent statement is a statement which um, for some substitutions it's true and for some substitutions it's false. So you see here the example P, therefore P and Q. If I make both P and Q true, I get true, therefore true and true. And from this, we know that we have a true statement. On the other hand, if I say P is true and Q is false, so true, therefore true and false as my substitution, I know that this is false, this is true, and so the entire expression is false. So that statement, P, therefore P and Q, is sometimes true and sometimes false. That's all we're doing when we're looking for the properties of statements. Now understand this is properties of statements. So statements are either true or false, 
statements are also either tautologies, contradictions, and contingencies. And what I also want to emphasize here is that statements are never valid or invalid. So the fact that a statement like P, therefore P and Q is true in an instance doesn't mean it's valid, right? That would be an incorrect use of terminology. So you want to be careful when we're talking about statements, sets of statements and so forth. A statement has a certain property. One of those properties is a tautology, another is a contradiction, or another is a contingency, and a statement can be obviously true or false. It can't be valid. Statements are not valid, only arguments are valid. Another thing we can do with truth tables is determine properties between statements or sets of statements. And two properties that um, we're going to look at specifically are equivalence and implication. So we can say about two statements that two statements are logically equivalent if and only if the truth tables under their major operators are identical. And we're talking about logical equivalence. It means if I substitute in various values for P, Q, and R, for example, in both statements, underneath their main connective, they will have exactly the same output or the same truth value. So two statements are logically equivalent if I substitute the same values in for each of the statements and they always come up the same. So in this case, logical equivalence doesn't mean they're always all true or all false. It simply means that whatever I substitute in for a statement, for each of the statements, I should say, they will always be identical under the main connective. The outcome will always be identical. Logical implication, on the other hand, says that one statement form logically implies the second if and only if there's no row in their joint truth table in which the first statement is true and the second is false. So if I have two statements and if I want to know with whether the first statement implies the second or the second statement implies the first, when I substitute in values for the given variables, if there's no row in their joint truth table in which the first statement is true and the second one is false, then I know that the first statement implies the second. And if it's the case that when I do that substitution, there's no row in the table that the first or the second statement is true while the first one is false, then I go know that the second statement implies the first. Now, if two statements logically imply both ways, so if statement one implies log logically implies two, and if statement two logically implies one, then I also happen to know that those statements are equivalent statements. So I'll show you some examples so you can see how this is, but these are just two more um, things we can do with truth tables, two aspects of statements that we can learn from doing a truth table. So you see here, I've set up a logical equivalence. Now, one way of doing logical equivalence is to add in is to set up a truth table for the statements, a joint truth table, and to connect the two statements that I'm comparing with the biconditional. Now you don't actually have to do this. If you drop this final step, that's fine. If you get rid of this biconditional role, that's fine. And if you simply read off each of the individual statements. So if I have statement one here and statement two, just list those. To know whether they're equivalent, just need, what I just need to know is whether they have the exact same truth value for every substitution. So you can see this is very simple. I've got statement one is false, statement two is false, and the outcome is true. Statement one, when I substitute P is true and Q is false, I get both come out false. When I substitute P is false and Q is true, they both come out false. And when I substitute false and false, um, here again, they both come out true. So what this does in the biconditional is just telling me, are these two values the same? And if they are not the same, then what this tells me is that not to the quantity P or Q in the first statement is exactly the same thing, logically speaking, as not P and not Q. So you notice here, these first two columns obviously are just setting up your base rows. These are just sort of your cheat sheet on the side. So again, if you were to simply write the values in directly under um, the first statement and the second statement and solve for it, that's fine. But this is just laying everything out for you. So you can see that this is all logical equivalence means, right? They have the exact same truth values for any substitution instance. And the biconditional is just the final step in which you're comparing the two rows. So again, you see here, there's nothing new. To determine equivalence, you simply set up a truth table, a joint truth table for the two expressions, connect them with the biconditional, and then just simply read down and say, are they in fact true under the biconditional? Are the two statements, do the statements end up, the compound statement made up of the two individual statements? Is it true under that biconditional? Yes, if that's the case, then the two statements are logically equivalent. We go through a similar process when we're talking about logical implication. So if I wanna know whether 
one statement logically implies another, the setup is exactly the same um, as I would do any truth table or any joint truth table. So I've set up here, I've got not the quantity P or Q, and my second statement is simply not P. And so the question I want to have, or I want to answer is statement one, or does statement one logically imply statement two? And does statement two logically imply statement one? So since I've only got two variables, this makes it easy because now I only have four rows in my truth table. So true, true, false, false, true, false, true, false. When I do the substitution for this, what I get is under statement one is false, 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 and true. So you can go through and do that if you'd like to fill in the actual truth table, but these are the final values under that first statement. For not P, it's easy. I just simply negate the true, true, false, false. So I get false, false, true, true. So now there's my values. Now the question is, do, does one logically imply two? So I look at statement one and I say, is there any row in which the first one is true and the second one is false? So obviously that's not the case in the first row, false and false, false and false for the second row, false and true for the third row, and true and true. So I would actually say then that one does logically imply two. Now, if I wanna find out whether two implies one, all I have to do is read the truth table in reverse. So notice when I went from one to two, I was looking at the left side and saying, is the left side true while the right side is false? Or is expression one true while expression true is false? And I said, no, there's no row. Now I can do that in reverse. I look at two and I say, in the first row, we have false and false. Second row, false and false. Now in the third row, you'll notice that I have statement two is true while statement one is false. So what that tells me is that two does not logically imply one. And notice here, that's all you have to do. So remember the definition for logical implication. One statement logically implies another if there's no row in their joint truth table in which the first one is true and the second one is false. In this case, not the quantity P or Q does imply not P, right? Because there's no row in which one is true while two is false. When I read it in reverse, I said, does two imply one? In other words, if I have not P, does that imply not the quantity P or Q? And it turns out, no, it doesn't, that there is a row in their joint truth table in which two is true and one is false. So again, this is all just understanding what the definition says. If you can set up a truth table and you understand the definition of logical implication, then all this is is simply reading off what the truth table is actually telling you. It's very much fill in the blank, um, very mechanical. It's just memorizing a definition. Another thing truth tables can tell us is whether a set of statements is consistent. Now, a set of formulas or statements are logically consistent if there is at least one row in their joint truth table in which they all come out true. So alternately, a set of formulas of statements is inconsistent if there is no row in their joint truth table which they are all true. Now, with consistency, we want to make sure we don't confuse consistency with validity. So statements are consistent if they can all be true at the same time. This is not to say that if you have a set of statements, so let's say we have four statements, that the last one is the conclusion. So we're not looking for a situation where the first three of the four statements are true and the last one is false. What we're simply asking is, is it possible for these statements to all be true at the same time? So much like the other problems we've already done, all you have to do to determine whether a set of statements is consistent is just make a joint truth table. Take however many statements you have that you're comparing, make up the truth table just like you would, what are the distinct number of variables, figure out how many rows you need, and then simply go across and ask, can all these statements be made true at the same time? Now, one thing we can do with consistent consistency statements is we can kind of use a reverse uh, or something like a reverse truth, short truth table method. So you could go along and say, well, now I'm going to try to make each of these true and just pick values that make each of the premises true. So it is possible to do that way. Oftentimes it's just quicker to actually do the long method. So depending on how many variables you're working with, if it's a small number, oftentimes just setting up a regular truth table is easier. But a consistent set of statements is not about validity. It's just asking the question, can these all be true at the same time? Which again, this is very mechanical. You set up the truth table, you look for 
the rows where they're all true. If you find one, it's a consistent set of statements. If you don't find a row where, there, where it all comes out true for a given substitution, then it's an inconsistent statement. So you see here in this example, we have a example of a logically consistent set of statements. So again, the first two rows here, or first two columns, I should say, are just our little cheat sheet, right? These don't actually factor into determining whether or not the statements are consistent. This is just our cheat sheet for setting up the truth tables. So once we've listed all the possibilities, so in here we have P therefore Q, Q therefore Q, P and Q, and P or P. So there's only two variables, which means we only have four rows. Now here, when we go through, all we're doing is simply going to our truth table, finding the values for each of those expressions. Once they're all done, I just simply look at each of these individual rows and I ask, is there any row in this joint truth table? So we have statement one, statement two, statement three, and statement four. Again, remember, there's no conclusion. These are just a set of statements. And I say, is there any row in which they all come out true? And it turns out that we do, in fact, have one row. It's the first one here. Very simple, just sort of stands out. This set of statements is consistent because there are at least one row in their joint truth table in which all the premises can be true at the same time. So that's all we're looking for in logical consistency is just that single row. Notice each of these are eliminated because they have a combination of trues and falses. And so we're not really, we're not actually concerned with those at all. We're just simply looking for that one row where they all come out true. So again, nothing new here for you, just a matter of making sure that you keep everything straight, that you line up um, your substitution instances, and then you're just able to read off. Do you know the definition of consistency? All true, all the statements are true in a single row. Then the statement is consistent. As long as you know that definition, there's nothing new here that you haven't already done um, in the previous unit. Now that we have the basic ideas down about tautologies, contradictions, contingencies, um, logical equivalence, logical implication, and consistency, I want to go through a number of examples. So some of these examples will be straightforward um, formulas, and then others will incorporate translations. So we'll start with just simple, straightforward formulas to determine the properties of the statements or sets of statements, and then I'll go on to translations. Um, so if you have not done worked on translations in a while, or you haven't, you don't remember some of the key words, you might want to go back to the previous unit, um, write down some of those key words to help you along with the translations. At this point, there's absolutely nothing wrong with keeping these things next to you. At this point, I would hope that you at least had memorized most of your truth tables. But even then, um, if you haven't done that, then you might want to keep the truth tables near you. You might also want to keep a list of those sort of key words that indicate connectives as we do these translations. So here we have an example of a tautology, contradiction, or contingency problem. So the question is, is this statement a tautology, a contradiction, or a contingency? So it's P, Q, and R. That means we have three distinct letters, which means we're going to have eight rows. So instead of drawing the sort of cheat truth table off to the side, our little cheat sheet side, I'm just going to simply put the values in for P, Q, and R underneath. The other thing I'm going to do is do the negations right up front. So P, Q, and R doing them in alphabetical order. Going to do true, four trues, and four falses. Q is true, true, false, false. And then R would normally be true, false, true, false, but I'm going to flip it and do the negation right away. So false, true, false, true. So here, now I'm already have identified the main connective of this as the horseshoe statement. So it's going to be the value under that horseshoe statement, which tells me whether it's a tautology, contradiction, or contingent statement. So here again, I'm going to do P, and Q again. And R is negated again, so we'll do false, true, false, true. Now, 
Now with those values, it's really up to you where you start. We know what the main connective, it's the horseshoe statement. So I'm gonna start on the left side, just working left to right. What's in parentheses first, P or Q. So looking at my true table for the OR statement, I've got true, 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 and false, false. Now look, comparing this row or this column and this column here, I've got true and false is false, true and true is true, true and false, false, true and true, true, true and false, false, true and true is true, false and false is false, and false and true is false. So just this half, I'm just gonna highlight that for as, as the antecedent of this very large conditional statement. Doing the same thing on the right side, working with what's in parentheses first, Q and not R, true and false, we got false, true and true, false and false, false and true, true and false, true and true, false and false, and false and true. Now obviously I'm doing what's under the conjunction here in parentheses, and I'm gonna do compare that with the P here for the OR statement. So true or false is true. I know these are all true because it's an OR statement, and so all of these are obviously gonna make the statement true. And I've got false or false, it's false, false or true is true again, false or false is false, and false or false, false. And again here, just to keep straight, what is the value for the antis or the consequent of this long statement? I'm gonna put the, the box around it. And now, false therefore true is true, true therefore true is true, false again I know is gonna be true, true therefore true, false I know that one's true, true therefore true, false therefore false is also true, and false therefore false is also true. And so now, when I look at this, and I say, what do I have? The value for this very long statement is all true, therefore it is a tautology. And that's it. Notice there's, again, nothing new here. Setting up the truth table, just making sure everything is arranged correctly and make sure you're working from the inside out, but all you have to do is know the definition of a tautology. Since these are all true, it's true under all, for all possible substitution instances, the expression is true under the main connective, therefore it's a tautology. Okay, the logical implication. So in this problem, I wanna know whether one logically implies two or two logically implies one. Again, I'm going to put the values for each of the variables directly into the problem as opposed to putting my little cheat sheet off to the side. There's three, means I have eight rows, P, Q, and R. So I'm going to start by simply listing all the possibilities. Four trues and four falses. And here, because we have the not R, just to save a little space, I'm going to immediately negate it. So normally this would be true, false, true, false for R. Therefore, when we flip it, negate it, it's gonna be false, true, false, true. So now I've got this done. Now I can go ahead and just solve this side, this first, this first problem to see all the possible values. So starting with what's in parentheses, P and Q. True, true, false, 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 false. And now if I do true or false, I get true, true or true. False or false is false. False or true, true, false or false false or true, false or false is false, and false or true is true. So here's what I'm going to be comparing, the column that I'm going to use. And now I do the same thing over on the second problem. So again, just putting out all the, all the possible combinations here, true, 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 false, 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 false. 
And again, true, true, false, false. And then I'm going to negate the R again right up front. So that's going to be false true. And starting with what's in parentheses, true or false is true, true or true, false or false, false or true, true or false, true or true, false or false, and true or false. Now do the conjunction. True, P is true, and what's in parentheses is true. So that's true, true, false, true. And these I know are all false because it's a conjunction. And so now here's the all the possible values, the outcome for the conjunction. Now notice I've done you've done a number of these truth tables at this point. So there is actually nothing new going on here. Now it's just, do I understand what the definition of logical implication is? One statement logically implies another if there's no row in the joint truth table where the first one is true and the second one is false. So if I start with the first one and I look true, 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 those pass. False I don't care about. True, true, false again I don't care about at this point. Ah, but here I've got true and I've got false. So you notice here, the first one is true when the second one is false. So I know immediately that one does not logically imply two. Now the question is, does two logically imply one? Now there's nothing left for me to do. In other words, there's no more work to do. All I have to do is read the truth table in reverse. So I start with two over here, the second expression, and then read right to left instead of left to right. So I look, the first one, true, therefore true, true and true, false, I'm not concerned with, true and true again, false, I don't, I'm not concerned because this one isn't true, well, the other one's false. I get down the line that here that already showed that false and true, that doesn't apply, and then I have two falses. So neither of those um, apply in this case. So uh, is there any row in the joint truth table in which the first, in which two is true and one is false? Well, no, there isn't. So in reading from right to left, there's no case where two is true and one is false. Therefore, I can say two implies one. So one doesn't imply two, but two does imply one. And that's all we're doing with logical implication. So again, as long as you've set the truth table up correctly, all you're doing is reading off what it's telling you. In this case, it tells me that this row, three up from the bottom, the first one is true and the second one's false. And then when I look at the second one first and say, is there any one where it's true and the other one's false? Well, it turns out, no, there isn't. There's no instance in which the second expression, the second statement is true while the first one's false. So two logically implies one and that's it. So I have a consistency problem. So this is three statements. Um, this is nice and easy because we've only got um, two variables, which means we only have four rows. And much as I've done before, I'm simply going to put the rows directly into each of the statements and then solve. So remember, a set of statements is consistent if there's one row in their joint truth table in which they all come out true. So let me just set up the problem here. As I said, this one makes it nice and easy because there are only four rows. So there I've got, and I've got my negations here, so I'm just gonna negate them right away. So if P is true, true, false, false, it's gonna be false, false, true, true. So I say false, false, true, true. And the same thing with Q, if it's true, false, true, false, it's gonna be false, true, false, true. So just flip those right away, save us a little time. And the last one, not the quantity Q, therefore P. So Q is true, false, true, false, and P is true, true, false, false. Now remember, because there's the parentheses, the negation is outside the parentheses, the negation is the last thing I'm going to do. So I'll start with, just starting on the right here, so Q, therefore P, you get true, true, false, true. 
Now I've got to negate that. So here is the value inside the parentheses. Negating that is going to be false, false, true, false. Now I go to the middle problem here, not P or not Q. And again, the order doesn't matter. You're just simply doing truth tables at this point. I've got false or false, false or true, true or false, and true or true. And then the last part, I've got just a standard horseshoe. This is just the truth table for the horseshoe statement. True, false, true, true. Now again, I want to be clear, what is it I'm comparing? Well, I'm comparing what's under the main connective here, which is the negation, the main connective here, which is the or statement, and the main connective here, which is the material implication or the horseshoe statement. And so now that I've got these set up, all I have to ask myself is, is there any row in their joint truth table in which they all end up true? Well, I've got true, false, false in the first. I've got false, well, immediately that one's excluded. Now I've got, in the third, I've got true, true, true. Oh, looks like I have one row in their joint truth table in which they all end up true. So this means this set of statements are consistent. So again, if you're finding this sort of repetitive, that's because it really is just a definition question. As long as you understand the definition, you already know how to do the mechanics of these types of problems. So a consistency problem, again, the only way in which this would get complicated is one, if you don't line up your truth table properly, because again, it, it depends on you being able to read across easily and see what the values are under the main connectives. If you get the wrong truth table, if you do a, a wrong substitution and don't know your truth tables, that's a problem. And if you don't know what the definition of consistency is. But notice all of those things are things that are easily remedied with just practice, right? So memorize the definition, make sure you you work neatly, and these problems are not particularly difficult. So there you have a, a very simple example of a consistency problem. So the next problem here is a tautology, contradiction, or contingency problem. And in this case, it's a two-step problem. First, we have to translate the English sentence into symbolic form, and then we're gonna set up the truth table. So the first thing I'm gonna do is sort of break this down into its component um, pieces. So the first part here, John likes Mary or Beth, but he doesn't like both Mary and Alice, and he doesn't like both Beth and Alice. So the first thing I wanna do is just identify each of the sort of simple sentences. So John likes Mary is gonna be one, John likes Beth, and John likes Alice are the three um, simple sentences that we're going to be working with. So in order to do this, I might say, put little parentheses, John likes Mary, and whenever I want to say that, I'm going to do capital N, M. John likes Beth, I'll use capital B, and John likes Alice will be capital A. All right, so I can just replace these in a shorthand sort of way with the letters I've decided. Now let me start with this first beginning piece. Um, John likes Mary or Beth. So I see a connective here, but he doesn't like both Mary and Alice and he doesn't, again another negation, doesn't like both Beth and Alice. So when I do it sort of this way, I see that I've got almost all the components necessary to do the translation. So I can sort of just read it off, right? So John likes Mary or Beth. Now the comma in here, which you can kind of see over here, tells me that I have a new section of my translation. So John likes Mary or Beth, but, and we know that that translates into a conjunction, he doesn't like both Mary and Alice. Now when it says not both, he does not like both Mary and Alice. We know that the negation comes on the outside. So he does not like Mary and Alice. Right? And then the last part, and, so again, that's nice and easy, it's just the dot. He doesn't like both Beth and Alice. So it's not the case that he likes both Beth and Alice. Now there's my translation. So in this case, I've got M, B, and A. I've got three letters, which means I'm gonna have eight rows. So if I do these just in the order they appear, M, B, A, I'm going to 
just do my normal truth table that we've been doing all along. Four trues and four falses. B, I'm going to make true, true, false, false. And we'll do A is true, false, true, false. So I'll do the M first. True, 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 false, 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 false. And then A is the true, false, true, false. Now, for this stage, it's easier for you to, to sort of put the little cheat sheet when setting up your tables. That's fine. I'm just, for space constraints here, I'm just going to put write these um, values directly in. And again, you can do it in any order you want. You could, for example, do it in alphabetical order. If you say I'm going to make A four trues and four falses, B will be true, true, false, false, and M will be true, false, true, false, and then fill them in accordingly. That's fine as well. In this case, I'm just doing um, what sort of makes sense based on the order that they appear in the translation. So here again, I've got B and A, so B is true, true, false, false, and all I have to do is make sure I stay consistent. And A, as we said, was true, false, true, false. So now I've got my basic setup. Now in this case, because it's a conjunction this way, it doesn't really matter where I start as long as I take each of these pieces starting from what's inside the parentheses and working out. So I'm just going to work left, left to right starting with M or B. So it's an OR statement. Whenever I see a true, I know it's going to be true. True, 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 false, false. Now I've got this as a conjunction. It's only true when both conjuncts are true. So I know false, true, False, 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 false. Once I'm done with what's in parentheses, now I have to take account of that negation that's on the outside of the parentheses. So the first row, true, becomes, becomes false. I've got true, false, true, 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 true. True, and so I'll try to keep that all lined up. Now in the last part, this last section, I've got not the quantity B and A. So again, it's a conjunction. So just go through and do do the truth to do what's in parentheses first. True, false, 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 true, false, false, false. And then of course flip it with the negation. False, true, true true, false, true, true, true. So now I'm going to put just these the boxes around the column to make sure that I know what things I have to compare next. Now at this point, you sort of have a choice and it doesn't really matter what you do. When you have three conjunctions like this, the logic of the conjunction doesn't change when you move or when you group these statements together. So for example, if I have a statement P and Q and R, right, if this is all one statement, it turns out that if I treat this is the main connective or this is the main connective, it doesn't actually matter for the logic of the statement. And this makes sense. If I have a dog and a cat and a hamster, then I have a dog and a cat and a hamster. I have a hamster and a cat and a dog. The logic doesn't actually change. So just so you know, it does not matter what you group. So for example, I might choose just sort of arbitrarily to put this in the same grouping and leave the second part, not the quantity B and A on the, out, on the outside of those brackets. That's fine. And if you moved it the other way, it would also be fine. If you said not the quantity M and A and not the quantity B and A, that two would get you the same answer. So in this case, I'm just going to group those first two together. But note that it actually doesn't matter if you chose one or the other. Sometimes from the context of the, of the statement that you're translating, you can figure out that it's sort of the intention would be to group these, that it seems logical to put these in a group. Um, but in terms of the logic, it's not going to make any difference. You're going to you come up with the right answer either way. So in essence, I'm treating this conjunction as the main connective of this very long statement. So now in this case, I'm just going to simply go through and compare these two columns, right? So I have true and false is false, 
true and true is true, true and false, true and true, true and true, true and true, false and true is false, and false and true is false. So there's a one part, and of course the second one is simply what's under here, right? So these are the ones I'm comparing now. I have false and false is false, true and true is true, and actually, if you look at this, if we understand what the definition of the tautology, contradiction, and contingency is, a tautology is a statement in which all the, um, all the results underneath the main connective come up true. Well, I already don't have that. They're clearly not all false. So therefore, I actually don't have to finish this entire column. I already know, because the first two are different, that this is a contingent statement, right? It's sometimes true, it's sometimes false. Our next example is implication and equivalence. Now, one thing I should let you know um, that perhaps you have already read in your textbook is that when one statement implies another, we know that there's no row in their joint truth table in which the first one's true and the second one's false. Um, we also know we can test implication in reverse when comparing two statements. The second statement, is there any row in, in the truth table where the second one is true while the first one is uh, false? So we, we know what the definition of um, implication is. And we know that equivalent statements are ones where their truth tables match up for every substitution, right? They have the same value under their main connective. So one thing that we may not have mentioned is that when two statements imply each other, that also tells us that they're equivalent statements. So equivalence and implication um, are actually closely related. When you have two statements, when one implies the other, when the first implies the second say and the second implies the first, we know that they're equivalent. So we can actually test for both properties, right? We can say that one implies two, two implies one, and we can also then make the further distinction um, that they're actually equivalent statements. So here, I'm gonna take this and do this as a standard implication. We have two statements, so let's see if, if they imply each other. Now again, since it's a two-parter, we have to do the translation first, and then we'll actually set up the truth table. So the first statement, if there is an increase in production and a decrease in interest rates, then there will not be an increase in unemployment. So starting out here, I'm just going to note the connectives. If there is an increase in production and a decrease in interest rates, then there will not be an increase in unemployment. So we see already we've got an if-then statement, an and statement, and a negation. Now in this case, I'm gonna say an increase in production, there is an increase in production is P. There is a decrease in interest rates, I'll label I, there will not be an increase in unemployment. So there will be an increase in unemployment, would be U, but I also know that that's gonna be negated. Right, so now remember, increase and decrease are not opposite. So the fact that something decreases does not mean there's an implied negation, right? Because there's always three possibilities. Something can increase, something can decrease, something can remain the same. So in this case, I always translate in the affirmative and then add a negation if there is one. So in this case, increasing and decreasing are not negated terms, but it turns out that there's an increase in unemployment. If there is not an increase in unemployment, which is what this statement says, then I throw a negation in. So starting here and the, the little comma also tells me that everything to the left of the comma is probably all in the antecedent. So statement one, if I were to translate, will be, so that's a conjunction. So P and I, then not you. So that's statement one and statement two do the same thing if there is an increase in unemployment. So here's our if, then. Here's another if then statement. If there is a decrease in interest rates, there's an implied, this says there's an implied then for the second one. There is no increase in production. So no tells me it's a not. So if there is an increase in unemployment, which we already was you, then if there is a decrease in interest rates, which we already said was I, there is no increase in production, P. So the second problem would be 
on this account. U, therefore, and grouping this together using that comma is my hint, I, therefore, not P. So there's my translation for those two statements. Okay, so you'll see here that I've already copied down the translation from the previous slide. And so now we're going to do the truth table to determine whether these, um, whether one implies two and two implies one, or in fact, whether they're equivalent statements. So here again, I have three distinct letters, which means I have eight rows. Um, I'm not going to do the little cheat sheet. At this point, we should be pretty comfortable with simply setting it up, putting the values in under each of the letters. So I'll do this again in order, just as they appear on the left here, P-I-U. So I will start with true, true, four trues and four falses, I should say. And then I will be true, true, false, false. And then U is true, false, true, false, but I'm gonna sort of speed things up a little bit and flip it, do the negation um, right away with false, true, false, true. And again, if you're still more comfortable putting out the putting down the true, false, true, false, and then doing the negation, that's fine. This is just a little bit of a time saver. Now, when I go over to expression two, I want to make sure I keep everything consistent. So you here is going to be true, false, true, false. And then I, of course, is true, true, false, false. Just like I did in the previous one. And then not P, I'm going to flip. So it was four trues and four falses. Now it's going to be four falses and four trues. False, 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 and the four trues. Now again, as I've said before, this is all what you've done in the previous unit. You already know how to do the truth table. So I noticed that in this first instance, the main connective is the horseshoe statement. In the second one, it's this first horseshoe statement here. So I'll start with what's in parentheses. I've got uh, conjunction, so true and true, true and true, true and false, true and false. And these, of course, are all going to be false. Now I'll compare what's under the negation with what's in the parentheses. So I have a horseshoe statement. So I have true, therefore false, true, therefore true. I know I have a false, so these are all true. And actually, all the way down here is nice and easy, because notice, in these cases, once I know there's a false in the antecedent, I know that it's going to come up true. So the values that matter here that I'm going to compare are finished. Now I go to the second part, doing the same thing. Do what's in parentheses first. I've already done the negation under the P, so just to know that those are already negated. True, therefore, false. True, therefore, false. False, true, 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 and true, true, and true, true, true. Now I'm going to compare that with the U, with what's under the values under U. True, therefore, false is false. Now that's true, true, therefore, true. False is true, true, therefore, true. False, therefore, true, 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 and false, true. So what I've got here. Now what I immediately notice, without doing really anything else, is I can see that these two are actually identical, right? So I've got false, false, and everything else is true all the way down. So what this tells me is two things. One implies two, two implies one, and actually they're equivalent statements. So again, the hardest part of this was probably just doing the translation if you're not as comfortable with translations, but it's straightforward truth tables. If you already know how to set up a truth table, um, if you already know how to do the translation, if you have the sort of keywords there, and these are fairly straightforward translations, this is the kind of thing you're likely to see on an exam, then the rest is just making sure that you line everything up and you know your truth tables. So there you have a simple example of both a logical equivalence and a logical implication. The last example I'm going to look at is a consistency problem. In this case, there are three um, sentences that we're going to have to translate. And then once we have the translations for those three sentences, 
we'll work on a joint true table and see if it's possible for them to all be true at the same time. So like I did before, the first thing I want to go through and sort of identify the component sentences and the connectives. So going to the first one, if the human population continues to explode, then the planet will become polluted and most animal species will become extinct. So if the human population continues to explode, then the planet will become polluted and most species will become extinct. So there I've got the connectives that I've identified. The human population continues to explode. Well, let's just give that the letter E, simplify that. The planet will become polluted. So I'll do P and most animal species will become extinct. I'm just gonna give capital X. So once we have that, we know that the first statement, if E, then P and X. And again, you see that this parenthesis here, along with where the then start, also gives me an indication of the structure of my translation, right? That comma tells me everything to the left of this is one unit, one piece, and everything to the right is going to be another. Now I go to the next part. If the planet is polluted, then the human population will not continue to explode. So again, I see an if then. Not tells me there's a negation. So we've already said what is the planet is polluted. We said is the letter P. Then the human population will continue to explode is E, except that we know it's not, right? So the statement will not continue to explode. So in this case, it's P, therefore, not E. So there's a second statement. And finally, if the human population does not continue to Get rid of that typo. If the human population does not continue to explode, then it is not true that most animal species will be extinct. So the human population does not continue to explode. So in this case, we know it's if not E, right? Then it is not true that most animal species will become extinct, not X. So we have for our third sentence is not E, therefore not X. So there's our translation. We have one, two, and three statements right there. Okay, so here again, I've copied over our translation from the previous slide. E, therefore P and X, P, therefore not E, and not E, therefore not X. And again, I'm just going to put the values in, starting with E, moving from left to right. Do four trues and four falses. Because again, we've got three distinct letters, which means we're going to have eight rows. P, I'm going to do true, true, false, false. And X will be true, false, true, false. And P again. And not E, I will do the negation. So four trues and four falses become four falses and four trues. And not E again, four falses and four trues. And not X, so X was true, false, true, false. So I'll do under the negation, false, true, false, true. And again, starting from what's in parentheses, so I'll go to this first, E, therefore, P, and X. It's a conjunction, so I will do true, 
false, 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 true and true, true and false, false, false. And then E therefore, so true, therefore, true, true, true and false, true, therefore, false, true, therefore, false. And I know that these are all true over here. And so again, just to keep straight what it is I'm going to be comparing. That's the main connective for that first statement. Second one, this is nice and easy. It's just the just a regular horseshoe statement. True, therefore, false. False, false, true, 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 true. So that's nice and easy. And then this last column, again, just a horseshoe statement. I know because there are these first four are false in the antecedent, I know these are all true. True, therefore, false is false. True and true, true, therefore, false, and true, therefore, true. So once again, the hardest part was probably the translation of this. It's a very simple truth table. Now if I just look and compare, what I want to know is there any row in the joint truth table in which they all end up true. So I look starting from the left here, I've got true, false, true, that doesn't do it. False, 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 that doesn't help me. True here, true here, and that's one, two, three, four, five, oh, I've got a false there, so that doesn't work. But right underneath it, true, 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 true. So it turns out there is one row in their joint truth table in which they all come up true, so it is a consistent statement. And that's all you have to do. So again, just like the other problems, understanding the definition. If you already know how to do the truth table and you already know how to do the translations, and again, these are fairly straightforward translations, do the translation, set up your truth table correctly, do the truth table, and then just be able to understand what it's actually telling you. Right? In this case, third row up from the bottom, and actually the last row, if I looked right to the bottom, might have been even, even easier to see, is also another one. So there's at least two instances in which these three statements are all true at the same time. All I need is one, therefore I know it's a consistent statement.